Hi, uh, good afternoon, folks. My name is Kashif. I work at uh, Direct Time, and I'm going to take you through some of my experiences uh, over the last year while developing Android apps. Uh, you know, these are things uh, that I think most professional or people who've done Android development for a while would find fairly obvious. Uh, this talk is more geared for somebody who's just started Android development. <coughs> and there's some maybe slightly counterintuitive things. Uh, things that you can maybe really find value in. Uh, if you find all this obvious, you probably know what uh, it is so good, probably is. Uh, so I will start. Before I begin, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our company so that you have some context about what app you are doing. Uh, so I work for Direkta, like I mentioned, and uh, we do some really exciting work. I'm working with one area of the business uh, that does uh, communication software. We think communication is largely broken. Uh, currently the way it is. And uh, as part of that, uh, you know, we have communication products on, uh, you know, on mobile devices, and that's why Android. Uh, you know, we have we write several components. We've got uh, desktop and web uh, clients as well. Uh, so we do all of that. We have a fun CEO who's downstairs. He should be there. I don't know uh, But he's downstairs. He should catch him. Uh, he's interested back to your world. How did I start it? We even have a stall. So you know, if you get to these things, catch us. Uh, and yeah, the stall. If you uh, we have an offer running in case you crack our uh, interview with an iPad 2, uh, no, no strings attached. Okay, the product that I am working on is called uh, Talk2. To, uh, Talk2 to is a communication uh, software and uh, we are currently building for Android, iPhone, uh, Blackberry, desktop and web client. Uh, you know, and the joke in the company is that we want to cover all platforms. Uh, so if you can't get it through any of these platforms to you, we deliver it in person. But somehow we deliver your message. Uh, we cover all kinds of services. We cover Facebook, uh, Gmail, Yahoo, uh, MSN. Uh, we cover all kinds of channels. Not all of this is completely developed yet. Uh, lots of stuff is under development. Uh, so essentially, what we're doing is uh, we're doing. Uh, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about particularly an Android chat application and my experiences uh, while building it. Uh, right here is a screenshot of an application. A very beta, slightly unstable version is available on the uh, app market. Uh, and our stable version is going to be out soon. We also have versions available on the web uh, as well as the desktop. Uh, so one of, my first, one of the first things that I want to talk about, uh, I've given a whole talk on the subject at Android Camp, I think, last year, uh, was uh, that for any non-trivial app, uh, you would want to use native uh, and not things like Titanium uh, or Phone Gap. Uh, and that is, uh, that's essentially, uh, you know, that's, that's the basic point. And uh, here, the one, some of the reasons that we service, uh, some of the reasons that you don't want to use uh, HTML5 or web-based services uh, is one that because they're usually not complete. They lose some 80% use case and you need some gadget, utility, widget that they don't implement and you'll find that missing. Uh, they're usually not very performant. Um, there was a talk earlier today also, and the gentleman highlighted the same point. They're not very performant, especially with things like scrolling, um, and we've had a lot of trouble with that. We've wasted a lot of time trying to make the things scroll instead of building the product. Uh, there are lots of counter cases in all of these, uh, in all of these solutions, phone gap, titanium, all of that, and their poor quality is horrendous to, to, to try. And typically, it's not always the case, but typically the poor quality is horrendous. If you try to open and modify something, uh, you know, it's, it's a pain. I have that talk up uh, on slide share. If you are interested in more details on why this sucks, there is a 30 page, uh, 30 slide talk there. And that's the link. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about uh, is debugging. And debugging is slightly different uh, when you do it with Android. So, you know, if you go, when you start developing Android, one of the sources, the sources that you go to uh, is uh, the dev guide. And there's a video staff there, and there are lots of great videos, you know. And most of them will talk to you about and tell you that you must use DVMS. But typically, we found that when we started actually developing, you know, use DVMS once a month or, or, or close to a release, you should really use DVMS more often than that. Um, so, how many of you know uh, are, are doing Android programming? Raise your hands. Yeah, and how many of you just started? Okay, fair. So, we have about most of the audience doing Android programming, and uh, I think about half of them have just started. Uh, 
so DDNS, uh, you know, obviously will tell you about what objects are created in your application, what your heat looks like, uh, you know, what your process heat looks like essentially. But importantly, it will also tell you about thread links. Uh, and I found that uh, you, know, you, you know there are uh, there are objects that don't get collected uh, because you've written code badly, uh, and you can, and DDMS will help you find that, and all of the documentation on DDMS will tell you about that. Uh, but you will also find thread links. Uh, if you use DDMS, you will find that there are some threads which are just not dying because they're waiting on some lock that you haven't released, and you don't realize that because that part of the application. Uh, isn't what you're working or isn't what you're testing. Uh, so if you use DBMS often to debug, you'll find, uh, you'll find those threads still there and your app will become a lot snappier. Uh, another thing that happens is that an IntelliJ user, if you're an Eclipse user, you get Mac uh, with Eclipse uh, for Android for free, right? And you start off on the right thing, you start off on Mac. But some IntelliJ users, uh, Mac is a memory analyzing tool for Eclipse. Uh, that tells you basically takes the dump that DDMS produces and kind of makes it uh, the kind of data of information you can use some of that. Uh, so you know when I kind of Google and you know how to use or uh, tools that use the dump, I found JHack and I used JHack for a really long time and JHack sucks actually uh, compared to Mac. So even if you're an intelligent user, you may not notice uh, there's a Mac standalone piece available uh, on the Eclipse side. You should use that instead. One of the really good reasons to use uh, that is because it's a dominator graph. Uh, so when you're trying to do uh, debugging, you want to find if there are objects uh, that you've left behind. Uh, a dominator graph uh, will help you uh, measure the impact that that object which, is, which you're looking or studying uh, has in terms of memory. So it tells you how much memory that object is taking and how much memory all the differences that object has uh, are taking. And so if you collect that object, what kind of memory will get released? Uh, this dominator graph is not available in that other tool. Uh, I find that extremely useful. Another thing I noticed is that often when you start using text, you don't realize that it has two uh, API signatures. Uh, one is start method tracing, uh, which is the filing that you want trace to dump into. Oh, that was loud enough. Uh, how many of you are familiar with what's trace you? Okay, so I should maybe talk about what's TraceView. Uh, very few people uh, raise their hands. TraceView is basically a, a profiler uh, that's available in the Android SDK. And you can essentially run it. How you run it is by uh, calling a function in your code. So you have to go and add this call. And as that code gets processed, the profiler starts recording all the instructions uh, that are being played out either in the emulator or in your device. Uh, and then profiles them for you and graphs them out and shows you uh, what kind of time various activities are taking. Uh, you should use profiler, uh, you should use a profiler anyway. And TraceView is the profiler for Android. Now when using TraceView, most people, uh, or at least we guys ended up look, using start method tracing and then you give it a file name and it dumps the profiling there and you realize it only ever goes to 8 MB. Uh, it doesn't go more. Uh, and you know for a while it can take to look uh, deeper into the API and see, there's an alternative call available in which you basically tell it that you can go ahead and extend the uh, file dump size from beyond 8 MB to something like 100 MB. And that's when it becomes useful. 8 MB is not really useful. It's about a few seconds of running your app. Another, uh, another excellent tool that we have found while uh, developing for Android uh, is Akra. And Akra basically helps you submit uh, you know, error reports, crash reports from the device uh, when an error occurs. So if you have any uncaught exception, right, you can configure Akra, you basically drop the jar, add some XML lines, and configure Akra to go ahead and submit that uh, either to a Google form or to your own custom app, it can do an HTTP post to it. And every time an exception occurs, when some user is using your device, you will get, uh, you know, you'll get that place, you'll get to know what device it is, and what was the memory there and a lot of other things. There's a lot of full stack trace, which you can just plug in and then debug. Now, most people don't end up using that, and I'm kind of surprised they haven't found this. So that's available on code.google.com uh, slash p slash uh, Akra. It's, it's completely automated. You can also do other things with Akra. It's extremely customizable uh, beyond you know, just simple automatic reporting. Uh, a third thing there which we found kind of useful, uh, you know, especially in debugging cases where uh, somebody's using your uh, device and you're not there. 
uh, to you know debug is that uh, screenshot right there. Uh, whenever somebody told us you know, internally this is a company that hey, I'm, I'm facing a problem, there's a bug, we tell them to go to the about screen and long press our logo, you know, uh, our item. And they get this menu saying send debug logs. You click that and then you use Akra to send those debug logs or post the state of their machine. And you can tell Akra I want to know memory, you know, I want to know uh, the state of this variable, so on and so forth, and you post all that. Uh, that's extremely useful. That's not something that one would typically find. And uh, if you do that, uh, you know, it will become easier for you to debug most of these cases. Yeah. yeah. No, it's for one application. Uh, you can, I'm sure, I, I don't know if you can use it for multiple applications, I haven't tried. But you configure it for one application, drop the jar, you add a little bit of external code and essentially you can do it. When you're configuring, you have to put it first during the build time, or if something like it is already APD is available, you can do it for that. No, you need to do it at the time. Because you have an API in Akra that you use, it's called error reporter, I think, right? And error, error reporter is what you use to report the error. So you can catch exceptions and then report it by Akra instead of uh, storing the app because it may not be an important exception, things like that. Uh, so in those debug logs, you can send Akra or log uh, data and that's useful usually to debug. Uh, the third point uh, that I thought was really important is slightly counterintuitive if you're developing for desktops uh, or servers is that you really don't think too much about memory, at least not on the outside. Uh, but Android, with this constraint, especially in smaller, low-end devices, turns out to be memory. Um, so when, whenever you're programming on the Android, the thing that you want to keep in mind is memory. And it has a lot of effects, but I'll talk about some of those things. <coughs> what are so what tends to happen when you kind of do desktop apps is, you don't mind storing these variables with state ready, Process already computed is all there, it comes of state. All that state is state in memory, right? And what happens when um, when your app reaches a certain threshold of memory that is allocated on the heap? Uh, it becomes eligible for garbage collection, right? And uh, it gets collected, and then that doesn't lead to good user experience. Uh, so try to store only bare minimum state. It's not something you do consciously. Uh, so try to store bare minimum state. Don't store everything that you need, that you could possibly need. Um, the other thing is that you don't, you know, we like using uh, statics. We like using statics quite a bit, at least I used to, uh, for writing utilities and things like that. And uh, what ends up happening is statics don't get collected because they don't get collected till the class gets collected, the class doesn't get collected till the class loader gets collected, so that's never. So anything you put in a static will stay, and will stay in memory. And, uh, and things you should not put in static are context, um, stuff that the UI framework gives you. Don't put it in a static because it can be left there, you know, and, or if you are using it in a static for some for some reason, remember to kind of go ahead, see all the code parts uh, and null it when, when you're done using it. Um, because that can just take memory, it can just grow and stay there forever. Uh, soft references are another thing you don't use on desktop code, typically. Right? But Java has soft and weak references other than regular references and uh, what soft references do for you is that uh, basically whenever uh, your heap is running short of space, uh, soft references are collected for you. Uh, so, you, you know, for, for example, in our app, uh, there was a screenshot earlier about, uh, there was a roster in that screenshot and it had avatars for users, right? So those, the reference to the avatar is a, is a great candidate, a bitmap, is a great candidate for a soft reference. Uh, because only the top, the eight that are visible need to be in memory. The hundreds that might be following it in that list don't need to be in memory. So if you use soft references um, and you scroll, you know, the view adapter will then kind of call the image to be rendered and uh, you can get it from your disk or wherever, show the image and as you scroll off, it's a soft reference and it will get collected as and when memory is required. Uh, again, something that you don't do on a desktop client typically not use soft reference. Uh, garbage collection. Uh, garbage collection is, 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 a, is a very interesting area, uh, especially on Android. One of the things I'm doing right now, actually I haven't quite finished doing it, uh, is I'm writing a little script that analyzes logcat output. And what that script will do is, as you're using your uh, application, there's a stream of logcat output, right? 
that output includes garbage collection lines. So it says GC concurrent or GC normal, whatever done for your process ID. Um, so what I think you're doing is that you know I'm going to trap all that uh, garbage collection output and figure out what screen or what activity I'm in by augmenting that output with uh, some logs, you know. So I know what screen or activity I'm in and see when garbage collection increases. Um, and when, whenever garbage collection increases, you know, that's a place where you've created too many objects uh, and done too many other things that you shouldn't be doing. Now why is this a problem? Because I think 2.2 and uh, earlier garbage collection is completely blocking in, in Android, right? So when we are collecting garbage, um, your app is not going to respond. Your process is not uh, scheduled, it's not running. So, uh, so what's better, and so what happens a lot is, for example, I find in some, some areas, we do, we create a lot more objects to render a screen, right? And uh, that area is going to be slow because of garbage collection. Now, I think 2.3 onwards, there is uh, partial, uh, partially concurrent garbage collection uh, happening. Uh, at least from the full garbage collection cycle, some of it is being made concurrent, uh, which is slightly better. So uh, that's another thing to look out for garbage collection. It, it kind of slows you down. It's not something you look for when you're doing a desktop app actively. You're not saying, oh, okay, what's my garbage collection? Uh, but I, I, I think you should do that when you're developing your Android app and see how that happens. Uh, one thing that object-oriented uh, compilers are really good at is making objects fast. You know, uh, as fast as they can be reasonably made. Obviously, there's a uh, memory allocation that happens, so that takes it the time that it has to take. But that's what uh, object-oriented compilers such as Java are really good at. Uh, they make objects fast. You know, when in doubt, make an object of something is probably the philosophy that you follow. Which is all great for uh, desktop. It's not so great uh, for Android uh, because you have limited memory. So it might be better to write your code in a fashion where you reuse objects instead of recreating them. Um, and so that's that's another case that's uh, useful and counterintuitive. Also, there is this API. This is there is this framework called on low memory. Uh, that is this is a method that's called by uh, the Android OS. Whenever it's running short of memory on all the services that are uh, that are likely to get collected, services or applications that are likely to get collected. So in this method call, if you release memory, like bitmaps, images that you're using, if you release all this stuff out, there's a likelihood your process will not be killed uh, and collected. Right? Uh, and so people don't actively use that. So it's not very easy to use it. Uh, typically, you don't end up having too much to release anyway, but you could release bitmaps and things like that. So that was memory. Uh, tip number four is that don't use services. Uh, services really get collected. Uh, so you know, you think you need a service. We, we, we are like, we're in a chat client with a service. Because so we think it needs to be constantly running for messages to come in, right? Uh, how can you write an application like a chat client which dies after a message is sent and then somehow wakes up when a message arrives? Uh, it's possible to do that in Android. Services are less likely to be filled than your application or activity, but uh, not having an agreement uh, because there's nothing to get connected and so there is no downside. Um, so I, do, I think really you don't need a service. Uh, we haven't completely migrated to a non-service thing yet because there are some cases we're still working on, but it's completely possible uh, to use C2DM, the push technology that Google provides, and an alarm manager, which is a uh, OS utility available uh, to you in Android. You can use these two features uh, to kind of uh, let you know when you when your process needs to come to life uh, in order to process something. So let me give you a quick example. Typical chat line would just be running it in and have a port open, uh, a socket open, right? And you'd be getting any messages that come on that socket and as they come, you process them and you show them to your user. Uh, what I'm suggesting you could do is you, once your user has gotten some data, the process can be killed, can be collected, and you've registered with the Google push service, and you've written a little server component uh, that whenever it gets a message, it raises a, creates a push to your phone through the Google push service. The push arrives on the phone, can be received on the phone uh, through the Android uh, utilities, and then you can go ahead and activate whatever little code that you need. For example, if it's a message that arrived, you can just show the message, create a notification for it, do whatever else. Uh, if you need to wake up periodically, not based on some event happening outside uh, on the network, then you can use Alarm Manager and that, will, that can wake you up uh, and call whatever you need to call on a periodic basis. So it is possible not to use a service at all. 
It's best if you don't use it. It makes your application extremely robust. Uh, another thing we learned was that we focused too much on snazzy devices. Uh, you know, when we, we had to order the phones to test, we kind of ordered all the, the phones that are now current in the market and cool. And they all have better specs than our users uh, were typically using. Uh, so you need to kind of focus on the right devices. And a couple of things that happened here. One thing that happened was that because we had good phones, uh, when we released in the market, so obviously the app ran well enough on our phones. Uh, like, for example, the Samsung uh, S2, right? The, that's the phone I had, and I tested the app, and it ran pretty well on that. So I said, damn, it's really easy. And we went ahead and released the application. And I found a lot of users uh, who had this phone using the app. And I thought, wow, actually, a lot of people use the S2. Uh, but that's not true. What happened, actually, was the guys who didn't use the S2 left our app rather quickly, because it didn't run so well on those devices, on the low-end devices, because we weren't testing for all kinds of low-end devices, right? So we could have easily been fooled there by, by thinking, oh, OK, only S2 and high devices matter, and we seem to be running all right on them, so we are fine. So you have to make it actually, the reason this is important is this is such a diverse platform. There's all kinds of things running Android, right? So I mean, if you're going to make your app available for them, you have to be very conscious and see what stuff, uh, what choices you're making uh, when you're doing this. You should kind of design for all. What I'm sorry. significance of using? Can you use the simulator for covering some of these cases? You, you could, for example, uh, see the Android emulator is a general emulator, right? It's fairly slow. You could use it. Uh, it turns out to be slower than most devices that are currently uh, being used, right? Uh, which are currently in the market. So you find that your performance on the emulator might be a little, little sad. Uh, iOS, for example, doesn't have this problem because they don't use an emulator; they use a simulator. They actually run it on your CPU at that same rate and speed of your CPU. So that's why all your iOS apps look prettier when they're being demoed. Like if you saw the apps today, oh, they were a lot, simpler, uh, a lot smoother, right? The reason they were smoother is because they were running on the full CPU. Whereas the emulator kind of doesn't do the full CPU, it uses some double instructions, essentially, and it uses only a portion of the CPU so as to emulate the device and the experience the user has. It turns out now that the emulator is is, is even slower than one of the, most of the lower end lower devices. So sometimes you're not able to uh, get close to reality <coughs> performance on an emulator. So you need devices, and you need low end devices. Can we check for resizing emulator? Is it really the same as how it is in the device? Yeah, for those uh, various resolutions, yeah, it's the same. And DPI and DPI, and I think very high uh, resolution. What is that for? Exactly. Yeah, something like that. So, yeah, it is very similar. You can design on the emulator. There's no problem with the emulator. It's a genuine emulator, so you can use it. Just that it will be tad slower than any device. Uh, you should kind of use the layout to move the that. Uh, you should do it because it's scale across uh, all screen sizes fairly well. So, whether it's a small uh, uh, device which has a keyboard on it, you know, uh, it will work on that, your design will work on that, you will work on a big S2 device as well. And uh, I think you don't have to support everything. You could, you could consciously decide to support uh, devices which are not very high. In. It's just a decision that beats, uh, sorry, which are slightly high. In. It's a decision that beats most of us. We don't even think about this actually, uh, most times. But you need to do this kind of thinking when you're releasing for the Android. Because anybody from a 7,000 buck Galaxy Y to a 30,000 buck uh, phone could be using, uh, you know, using your software. And you haven't tested that robustly. One minute for what? UX for the Android. Our UX team would ask us, can you do this? Right? Can you do that? Can you make it look like this? Can you make it look like that? And we say, hey, we'll check and get back to you. That checking for each of these questions took a few days. So we can save you all those days. And almost everything is customizable. Not almost actually, everything we have met is customizable. That you have to do is customizable. Android allows you to customize. Anything. We've customized all of this stuff. You see, typically Android apps look pretty ugly. I think ours looks really nice uh, in comparison, at least. Right? And the reason for that is the reason for that is we've customized everything. Look at our tabs. You can look at our list view. And it works. So when when you are developing for the Android, the thing you need to tell your UX guys is do everything you can do. 
you know, we'll manage this kind of way. We've got, you know, don't say keyboard here, we've even got a keyboard with a smiley, uh, special item for a smiley, right? The typical smiley, things like that. You can customize anything. Yeah, that's completely possible. Here, this is our generally slow, right? This is doing this. Uh, but data based on the Android, which is uh, SQL-like, uh, you know, on a small, low-end device is really slow. It's, it's actually very slow. So what happens is you see this. You can see this if you're not doing it right. So when you are not doing it right, you know, when we started, one of our biggest performance problems is scrolling, right? And uh, our CEO is sitting right here, and he has some obnoxious number of people that he knows, some 8, 10,000 of them, and he wants them all on his roster. Right? And we blokes, you know, we don't know so many people. So we were pretty happy with the testing real time. Oh, a couple of thousand it works and all that. So uh, we, tell, we tell our CEO that, listen, Bhavan, you should test the app, you should try it out. So the first thing Bhavan does is uh, he picks the lowest end device he can find, an HTC legend. That's all we right? And he runs the app on that, right? And the app doesn't run wrong. Which, uh, I, I, from what I heard, it was pathetic. And the reason that happened uh, is because you had a largest roster in it, the device was low end, and we had to fold into building for medium and high end devices uh, without actually thinking about uh, size that big. Right? Uh, and so one of the things we were doing wrong, so we had to fix this, one of the things we were doing wrong is that we were thinking SQLite is like SQLite on a desktop. You know? so we need an item when you need it, you know, and then we show it and things like that. And we improve performance to velocity just by doing stuff in batches. Uh, batch writes are not actually full in SQLite right? uh, because it doesn't do multiple <coughs> single, it doesn't do a batch itself. Uh, but there's a lovely little utility somewhere deep, I don't know if it's, yeah, it's documented, uh, somewhere in the annual code list called database users dot insert helper. And what that does for you is it allows you to do multiple inserts, they compile it once and execute it once. The inserts are still single, they're not batch, it's not a batch insert, but it's slightly better than doing individual uh, writes. Another thing we learned was that if there is anything happening on the UI, please don't be doing anything on the database. This is, again, this is not intuitive, right? Uh, I mean, you don't, you don't go and think, hey, this is what I should be doing. But that's what you should be doing. Uh, if there's anything happening on the UI, on the UI thread, basically do nothing. That's definite. And on, don't run any other thread, don't do anything else when you're working on the UI. On the lower devices, that's what's going to give you performance. If you start writing even on a different thread to the database, you will notice an occasional jerk. Uh, or things like that on your UI. So you don't need to do that. So you need to write your code in a fashion where work gets held and deferred. And then you do that work later. Right? Either when that activity is not there, there's not much happening on the UI, or when the UI is off, or something like that. Or the user is looking somewhere else. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Services are, they're not bad. I'm saying you show new services if you can. I think you can, you can avoid using a service on the That takes, includes the criteria of the data collected and the app restarting and all of that. That can all be taken care of if you don't use a service. So what they're saying here is one of the, one of the contradictory points that I raised was, hey, don't keep too much stuff in memory, but do batch streams. If you're going to do batch streams, you're going to use a lot of stuff. In memory. So you're going to, you have to read some kind of uh, heuristic or taste based on your own app and figure out how much you can do it, how much you can't do. Both those things are true in my experience, but it's a balance you need to strike. So, uh, so I would assume that if you're, uh, if you're doing this as a multi-threaded um, app, then while I'm writing, while the write is blocked, like, I mean, why should, why should it impact yeah. my uh, processing on the UI side? Yeah, that's Bhavan, that's my CEO who has the really bad performance. And uh, his question is that, uh, then if I'm doing another thread, why should this block? But in terms of the processing part, uh, and, and writing to disk is so slow uh, on low-end devices on Android, uh, that even if another thread is doing it, the CPU gets utilized quite a bit, or uh, you know the, the, the IO channel gets utilized quite a bit, and you don't get the kind of output that you want. So if you notice, so you know, typically on a desktop, you won't even care. You say it's on a different thread, my CPU is fast enough, my disk is fast enough to multiplex multiple threads, and I don't realize it, right? But you kind of end up seeing it when it happens on the Android. I think it's specifically where we saw it. Um, so when we started doing batch writes, we would, we would ask for people's avatars to write. And you know, we, we thought we'd batch them up and write them at one time. So if you ask for 
take contacts, uh, user profiles or avatars to arrive. We would get those eight and we would write them. And the user still scrolling on the screen and we are bashed in the writing and we could see jerks. Right? Now that shouldn't be happening if it's on a different thread. Right? On a desktop you won't think that would happen. But we saw jerks. And obviously it wasn't intuitive to us what the hell was happening. So we started using Trace to do and DDMS to try to figure it out. And we kind of realized that even us writing to disk at that same time when there is some exhaustive UI work, which is CPU intensive, CPU intensive story is happening. Then you can have a bit of a bottleneck. So that's so I'm assuming that your UI thread actually needs 100% of the CPU at that point in time. Because the amount of CPU to the right operation you would need before it would hit this, at which point there's no CPU required. Yeah, it, yes, I, I get the point, but it actually needs 100% CPU. What? Scoring is very CPU intensive despite the GPU. Correct, that's, that's yeah, what I'm saying. But it still doesn't need 100%. Uh, the background services that are running on Android, they're all consuming some amount of dedicated uh, CPU. They might be doing stuff themselves. So yeah, but if you're reaching a fairly high point of saturation, in terms of CPU, you start seeing that kind of behavior. Again, this is on slightly lower devices. You do not see this on an S2. You probably won't. You just go past. But you try it on a, uh, a Galaxy Y or you try it on a Samsung Galaxy S, the first one, you see, you, you could see these issues. If you're doing anything on the UI, the user is interacting with the UI. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm going to say. So if the user is interacting with the UI, therefore writing to databases and things like that for later. So for example, let, the, let it batch up for a little bit longer. Right? The moment the, UI, the user is done scrolling, then go ahead and write it down. Don't do it on a different thread at the same time, parallelly. You, have, you can't do anything anyway on the UI thread. In fact, what you're saying is while UI processing is going on, don't do any other CPU activity. Exactly, that's probably okay, It has nothing to do with necessarily just writing to the database. Yeah. To any other CPU activity, you're going to block the UI thread or you're going to have context which out to the UI thread and fetch the result in Yeah, but most CPU activity turns out to be much faster. Uh, and this turns out to be a case that we end up doing. Uh, but yeah, this is like basically, essentially, when there's something happening on the UI, you don't want to be doing too many other things. Hold them, defer them for the UI to kind of stop doing what it's doing and then go ahead and do this. Right? Uh, so that's, that's what, does that clarify? So, we need to come into the middle of complicated patches, right? I mean, so you're saying the moment, let's say someone starts scrolling, somehow you have to notify or lock your CPU intensive or write user intensive task. The moment the UI stops scrolling, then again you wake it up. Are you yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, and it's a good thing. Yeah, I think you have a book that you said you saw a lot of jerks. You weren't talking about your friends or your list, right? <laughs> I was talking about myself. Uh, no, uh, yeah, that was not what happened. Yeah, but we did. That's exactly what you're saying. We do have slightly ugly code doing this. We're not pleased about it, uh, but it kind of helps the performance. As long as the user feels the app is snappy. I mean, you know, we really believe that fast and snappy is a, is a feature now, you know, in this age. You can use Chrome for no, no really good reason other than it being really fast. Uh, so, yeah, so you want to do this kind of stuff if you have to. Have you tried the interactive search where you, the user keeps on searching for some item and then you go to the database and start search indexing? Uh, oh, I don't tell you the I still hear you Put the questions to there and let him finish his talk first and then I'll have a discussion. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that later. I would hear uh, Another thing I can recommend is, you know, we know networking leaks badly, uh, but it really leaks badly. There's a couple of uh, things that we have learned there. There's a gentleman uh, who has, I think, who works for the Qualcomm processor team or something. And they obviously build stuff for Android. And he did some research that Steve Souders, who's a guy who used to work at Yahoo for uh, fast websites, or for fast JavaScript, uh, you know, blog about. Uh, and they dis discovered basically that radio is expensive, which it is. Uh, so when you're on GPRS, you're getting your data through, through radio, right? So after 10 seconds of inactivity, uh, what Android does is, in order to save battery, it kind of makes your uh, uh, your radio connection dormant. It turns down the volume, is one way to think of it, and which consumes less of power. But then what happens is, if at the 11th of the 12th second, just after this has been done, the user wants to uh, use the app, uh, you know, and do something. Uh, then what happens is, it, it leads to a spike. When that uh, when the radio link is turned back up, right? Uh, so this the spike is kind of fairly large when it starts or when it's turned back up from dormant. 
and then comes to a level and stays at that level for a while and then if it's at that level for about 10 seconds, they turn it down further. And then to get it back from there, it takes a spike. So if you are in a chat pane and you're chatting with your uh, with, with somebody and your app knows that the user is actively chatting with someone and the screen has a lock, right? Send a ping packet or something just to keep your uh, network alive so that the radio doesn't go down, so the user finds it uh, responsive. That's one uh, use case of this uh, information. Uh, the other thing is obviously you can uh, you realize uh, where your power consumption is going to start looking at things like this. Uh, one thing to do to reduce power consumption uh, is multiplex. So don't make money, many sockets and amortize whatever sockets you have. So for example, if you have a socket which talks to your server, uh, and you can substitute at least the incoming data with Google uh, C2D and push service. Right? Uh, so how, how that runs is that Google has one socket open on your device all the time. Uh, and it's used across multiple applications. So if you use that socket and don't create another socket, you're not using extra banking. And you can only do that if you're using push in your device. So you should all use push. Uh, also, if you still need a socket of your own, uh, you should multiplex. I'll give you a use case. For example, if a user adds multiple accounts to our application, right, uh, we can create one socket for each of these accounts with our XMPP server and chat. Uh, but the better way to do that for mobile devices is to take one socket and put all your three streams or four streams or as many accounts as they open on that one socket and you know just uh, add an attribute that says your XML to indicate which stream this belongs to. So use one socket, don't use multiple sockets. Again, something you won't think of when you're doing desktop programming too much. Prefer native TCP, we kind of learn this a uh, very hard and complicated way, but uh, TCP is fast and simple, and you don't have to write code to do anything on it, that code is in the library. Uh, don't, and don't build stuff on top of TCP unless you really, really need it. Uh, you should just plainly use TCP, it's fast, it works well, and it's still the battery. The last uh, tip and experience that I've had is around monitoring and similar stuff. So I'll tell you just a couple of things we found very useful. One, Google Analytics, while it claims that it is friendly towards uh, uh, Android and iPhone devices for analysis, is basically useless. Uh, so you don't want to spend time on Google Analytics. Just skip that altogether. I think somebody's going to give a talk about a tool I'm recommending, uh, which is called Flurry. Flurry is a pretty decent tool. It gives you a lot of information. Uh, so I would recommend that you use uh, Flurry. Uh, it has an SDK for Android, so it's, you don't have to write any code. You just have to say send this code and we'll send it for you. Uh, you, can, you know, it can monitor custom events like, are people swiping through my app, right? I, I'm monitoring that. I see that about 0.01% people swipe through my app, you know? So I can give this information back to my UX guy um, and, and he can do something with it. So all of this stuff is kind of important because you're not there seeing the user use the app. Uh, so Flurry is very useful. Another excellent tool which is not talked about quite a bit uh, is lying again also in the SDK, in the Android SDK quietly, is Monkey Run. Uh, how many of you have heard of Monkey Run? Good. So, uh, so okay, that's good. That's about 40% uh, of the audience. Um, that's great. All of you should be using Monkey Run if you're doing this. What Monkey Run does is Monkey Run allows you to uh, uh, automate uh, or emulate a user using your app. Basically, through the ADB bridge, you are able to send uh, commands uh, and make the app behave in a certain fashion. So you can use that as a basis for building automated tools like Robotium, uh, but that's just one, one kind of use case. If you can basically automate, uh, you know, flow through an app, you can do a lot of uh, interesting things. So you should look up on the run. So that's uh, more or less what I had. Uh, I, I hope some of you will find that useful. Are there any questions that I can answer? Uh, yeah, you can get in touch with me on that Twitter address or my email address at direct time. And I hugely recommend uh, that you come and check out our stall. We'll tell you we have a lot of openings, we need a lot of bright people, uh, and we're doing some exciting work. Uh, there is actually a limit on uh, C2DM. It's actually 200,000 per day. So There is a software. Yeah, there is a limit on that. Uh, and it gets paid uh, if you cross that limit. So, I mean, how do we replace a service uh, using push? So you've got to be really creative going beyond that. Uh, 
that one more doubt will take one more question. This is regarding the Android multitasking. Uh, I have doubt upon async tasks as well as the handlers. So it can be answered by anyone. What I have, I have observed is like uh, I am doing an async task and I am doing it in an activity. So that activity is completed. I am moving to another activity where I have another async task. So I have already done an async task cancel in the other activity, first activity which I have been done. But when I am moving into other activity where I am starting the async, another async task activity, the previous async activity is not uh, closed. It is still running even though I have cancelled. I have observed the same thing with the handlers also. If I am using a handler in Android and uh, it, it is in one activity, so I am moving on to another activity, I am using another handler. Even though I start, stop that handler there, I am observing that the control goes to the handler which has been already stopped. Yeah, so um, the question is open to everyone. Uh, but async task does not guarantee that when you, when you cancel it, it will close immediately. So the point that they are making is that async task does not guarantee that when you cancel it, it will cancel immediately. There is another API uh, there called is cancel, right? And that returns the boolean and that tells you uh, whether your cancellation request succeeded or not. So you need to use the API on that function. Even though in handlers also it's the same case, if you are using a handler also. So I don't remember about the handler, maybe somebody else to answer, but for async task can answer. Thanks. I would avoid using async task altogether because uh, I'm sorry. I would avoid async task altogether. The thread pool that uh, you can use only has one thread in it, so async task is essentially you can do one thing in the background and then you have to queue it up to do the next thing. Uh, okay, so well, I'll repeat that because I, I don't know if it was audible. Uh, and he was saying that he would recommend not using async tasks at all, and I couldn't hear quite the rest of it. So if we can get him a mic. We can go into some depth. Hi. I would recommend not using async tasks at all. Not just because of the boilerplate that uh, is inherent in using it, but also because async tasks are run by a, a single thread, uh, a single thread, thread pool, which means that you can only run one async task at a time. So what I would probably do in response to that would be use uh, 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 an unbounded thread pool using executors, uh, uh, executor service uh, with that, and then using a handler to, to shove uh, things back out onto the UI thread. All right, uh, that's why I love this talk. Thank you for being here. Now we have a tea break and the next session will start at 3.45. Thank you.